Hi, my name is Heath Jones, and if you're watching this, you probably already know that I'm the pastor of Northwood Christian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. But in case you didn't know, you might want to check us out at our website to learn more. We're at www.indyncc.org. That's www.indyncc.org. In the meantime, we find ourselves on the other side of Easter. I don't know if you celebrated over the course of this past week, but we did at Northwood. And one of the stories that is most often told on the week after Easter is the story of Thomas, or as he's more popularly known, Doubting Thomas. And you can read about it in the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John through verses 19 and 31. And it goes like this. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This story begins with the disciples hunkered down, in hiding, afraid, and no doubt uncertain about their future. Very relatable emotions. We often find ourselves anxious about our own futures. But I should pause for a moment to note something that may have stuck out to you. The text reads that they were afraid of the Jews. And I feel it necessary after centuries of anti-Semitism to make it clear that it was the Roman government that put Jesus to death. Crucifixion was a distinctly Roman punishment in those days, and while the disciples may well have been afraid of certain collaborators who were Jewish by nationality, it seems odd to say that the disciples were afraid of the Jews generally as a collective, because you see, they were Jewish as well. Everyone in the story that we're reading today is Jewish. Jesus himself, in fact, was a Jew, died a Jew, identified with that tradition. So it's important for preachers like myself to note this because Christians who come later will affix the blame for Jesus' death on the Jews as a collective, and this has led to, abetted, and or excused the persecution and even the mass slaughter of Jewish people throughout the centuries. And 
History in this regard is well documented. I probably don't need to tell you. It's a terrible history that Christians like myself should be unsettled by and take ownership of, which is why I want to be very clear here from the onset the Jews as a people and Judaism as a religion are not responsible for the death of Jesus. It was the Roman Empire that killed him, as was common for them to do in those days whenever they felt a popular figure or a religious zealot might participate in an insurrection in an attempt to secure their freedom from the Roman Empire. All this being said, the disciples... Jewish Jesus followers are afraid at the beginning of this story, and they're hiding away. And they're hiding because it seems as though they do not yet know about Easter, what we were talking about last week, about that power in God that can hold them through any disaster, through death even. And I'm not so sure that our situation today is very much different. This year, Did you find yourself on the other side of Easter still unfraid and uncertain? Now, I was shorn up by Easter. I was encouraged and given hope by Easter. But I also find myself today, as I record this, uncertain and at times afraid for my future. We leave our churches and go back into the same old world that we've always lived in. One filled with brokenness and promises half-kept. A few years back, I left the church on Easter and responded to a call into the hospital for a visit for a congregant who was was found who found themselves in an emergency situation and with few exceptions people in hospitals are stuck on the wrong side of easter i leave an easter service into the wrong side of easter morphine haze cords and wires beeping noises that keep the sick from getting the rest that they need i left the easter morning sanctuary a place where the power of easter hung in the air electric only to return to a place where Easter seemed a more distant hope. And that juxtaposition still sticks with me. In today's story, when Jesus made his appearance to the disciples, Easter had happened. It had happened. Jesus had risen, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it from the faces of the disciples, the looks. You can just sense their sorrow, their fear. They're hiding in fear for things seemed worse than ever from their vantage point. Their Savior had been killed. And maybe they were next, who knows? So it's no wonder that they're afraid. It was in this sort of situation, a fearful situation, an anxiety-drenched situation, that Jesus came and spoke those words, peace be with you. That word peace is the English translation of a Greek word that is equivalent to the Hebrew word shalom. And that word means peace, wholeness, fullness, even harmony. Think of it, fullness, harmony, and wholeness spoken into a situation that cultivated such feelings of emptiness, fear, and an overwhelming sense of incompleteness. Jesus' life cut short. But then Jesus appears, and they are amazed. And then Jesus shows shows them his scars, and when they see this, they rejoice. So what gives? How might the revealing of tragic scars cultivate joy? More on that in a second. But first, the story focuses, its, it shifts its focus to Thomas, who has missed the first big reveal. And, and so he wasn't so sure. He said a week prior, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And You've no doubt heard at this point about doubting Thomas. He has become something like the patron saint of doubters, and some people don't know quite what to make of him. You know that doubt is not always welcome in religious circles. It is sometimes tolerated so long as the doubt quickly transitions into something like certainty. So, for some, the good thing about the Thomas story is that his doubt subsides and he then believes. But others have found solace in the fact that Thomas doubts and is given, in this place, space to do so, space to doubt. You may have noticed that some time passed 
a week, in fact, between the time when Thomas stated his disbelief and the second appearing of Jesus to the disciples. And that means that he had the opportunity to elaborate on his doubts, no doubt over several lunches and dinners or time spent passing by with his friends, time where he was able to elaborate uh, and to seek understanding, to seek to be understood, and to still shake his head at the end of it and say, still, I don't believe. I don't. I can't. And there's a lesson here. Churches like mine need to do a better job at providing space for doubt. I know many people who have left their religious communities because their doubt was given little to no space. And I can remember how uncomfortable it made me and others when someone in our community Faith community questioned some of our basic assumptions, even assumptions about the smaller things. But in Thomas's case, he is allowed to continue in relationship with the disciples. Indeed, he isn't kicked out of the club. He remains a disciple. And this is a good thing. And no doubt his friends tried to convince him with arguments. No doubt they pulled out their copies of Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ or some other apologetic work and read its arguments till they were blue in the face. Of course, I'm kidding there. But they had just seen Jesus, so no doubt they had things to say, thoughts about Thomas's doubt, and maybe even became frustrated because of Thomas's doubts. But Thomas remained unconvinced. You've probably had a friend like this about some other issue. You couldn't convince them. You couldn't convince them, even though you knew what you knew. Well, after a week of the tension... With Thomas, Jesus arrives, and the first thing he does is the same as he did the last time. He speaks peace into the troubled room. Peace be with you. And after that, the text reads, starting with verse 27, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. That last line, an emphatic statement of amazement and awe his wildest hope coming true. And it wasn't until Jesus returned and showed him his scars that Thomas was convinced. What is it about our scars that speak sometimes clearer and better than our words? Before our first child was born, Kelly and I were on the receiving end of no shortage of advice and comments. The dominant theme of these comments was, you have no idea what you're in for. And we were told that what awaited us in parenthood was something akin to the end of the world or the end of our lives as we had known. We were told we would never sleep again. We were told we'd have no time for friends. We were told that our children would then grow to be little monsters and then bigger monsters. We were told that when they become teenagers, they would become something like insurgent enemies in our own house. And you know, Never having been parents, this bleak picture made us wonder, what's the point then? Why have kids at all if it's that bad? But there was one couple at our church who had six children, more children than anyone else at our church. And one day, that father pulled me aside after having listened in on a conversation that I was having with someone who was painting a doom and gloom scenario for our future as parents. Well, this father of six pulls me aside and said, take it from me. At first, there's an adjustment, but it is wonderful, and you'll do fine. This coming from a father of six. Their ages range at that point from the mid-20s to four years old. And when our second child came, same man said to me, the jump from one to two is the hardest, but it'll be far easier when you make the jump from two to three. Well, now we've made that jump from two to three. I have three kids and I'm not afraid because someone who has been here before has shown me his scars. That father of six spoke as someone who had experienced the ups and downs of parenting and looking at things from the other side was able to tell me that it would be okay. He showed me his parenting scars. 
He had lived to tell the tale. And I learned by way of his scars that I, too, could make it. Jesus came to Thomas from the other side of something far worse. Parenting's not bad, but what Jesus had gone through was the worst of the worst. He came to Thomas from the other side of death, from the other side of the very worst that could happen. And he showed Thomas these scars. Now, Thomas sees that no matter what happened next to him or anyone else, it would be okay. Notice, Jesus has not convinced anyone by way of argument. Thomas was convinced by the scars of Jesus, scars that testified to God's ability to carry us through, to endure, to make it through even death. And then Thomas believes. He believes not because he has bought into the best and most clever arguments about Jesus or about God. He believes because he has seen the scars of someone who has suffered greatly and has lived to tell the tale. And then Thomas says, In wonder, O Lord my God, a confession of faith. And his response is proportionate, for it's truly amazing what he saw there. Those scars... And you know, those who doubt very seldom need our arguments. In fact, too often I've found that our desire to argue stems from our own fears and insecurities. The doubts and questions that have most raised my ire and prompted my impassioned defense have been those doubts that I myself shared and was too afraid to name in myself. Instead of arguments, what we need are testimonies, stories told that reveal what God has done. In short, show them our scars. I found that stories about our times of struggle testify more truly than any arguments we can make about God or Jesus. I've found that stories of endurance through struggle are by far the most convincing story. When I've sat with others in their grief, my own stories of grief and the ways God found me there have caused others to say in their own way and using their own words the equivalent of, Oh Lord my God, and they find faith. In this passage we read today, Jesus concludes, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet come to believe. This sentence is not meant to set up a two-tier system of discipleship divided by the more faithful who believe without seeing and the lesser faithful who see and then believe. Remember, this book was written for the generations of Christians who came after, for us and many others. It was written for everyone who came after who had no choice but to believe without seeing. Think of it. Everyone alive today who believes in Jesus, including you and me, has never seen him, not at least in the way that the disciples saw him that day. So this sentence, calling those who believe without seeing into greater faith, is about you and me and all of us, all of our friends who have no choice but to believe or not believe, whilst never really seeing the whole picture, all of what may be necessary for some to find faith, and yet we believe. There is no one alive who has ever been in Thomas's position, so how much harder is it for us? But at the same time, there is no other way for us to come to faith, unless, that is, you count the ways in which we see the power of Jesus at work in others. There's where we catch glimpses of him. When we consider that the disciples also took up their own crosses in their own way and would come to bear scars of their own, then in them we also see the scars of Jesus. I've seen the scars of Jesus on my parents as they've endured hardships. I've seen the scars of Jesus on the great heroes of our time who have borne great suffering for the sake of Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King Jr., Dorothy Day, and many others. And if you remain in doubt, let their scars that reflect the scars of Christ begin to teach you about the power in God to overcome.
come. This revealing of scars has been the work of the church ever since. The passage we read today concludes with these words, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Deeds not written in John's gospel, or any other gospel for that matter, that reveal the power of God in Jesus Christ. You too are a part of this. Our deeds may not be written in any book, but it is hoped that they will reveal the love of God in us. We too will grow scars in time, signs of healing over sometimes very deep wounds, impossibly deep wounds, but as we share our scars, tell our stories, perhaps we will be the ones who speak peace into the lives of others. Our scars, life's time-tested battle wounds, can serve as encouraging metaphors to others who need to know that life finds a way through death and back to life. And those of us who are able may join with Jesus in the sharing of our scars, what we've been through along life's way. And perhaps when we share our scars, many others will find hope themselves, that they too will make it through. Perhaps others, even doubters, will begin to hold on to a cautious hope that grows into a reckless hope that brings them to a better place. And maybe others will remain in doubt, but no longer doubting alone as followers of Jesus throw off their fear of doubt and even cultivate space for doubt to remain in our communities for those who doubt. But all of this, we hope, will serve as a testimony to the hope we found this side of Easter in the week after Easter and in every day besides. So if you are ready, show them your scars. Tell them about your life and your struggles, but also of the life that found you on the other side, life that helped heal you and heal those scars. And why? Why share about your healing and why share of your scars? Because the healing of your scars could be the only argument for Jesus that they need.